sense. So that's, that doesn't help us. Unfortunately, in the course of preservation and restoration of the column since the 17th century, these scenes have been erased, so ancient discoveries cannot verify this evidence. Since we don't know the answers, we need to go to Italy ourselves. Mike Lodes has traveled to Rome to investigate the last remaining breeds of this ancient dog. Dogs like these could have been bred by Roman military dog handlers. These are mastiffs. They're sniffing me. I hope they're not checking out their next meal. They're not pet dogs. These are our guard dogs. They're big, ferocious, brave, fierce dogs. And they're the sort of dogs that might have been around in ancient Rome. Certainly, Roman writers such as Pliny talk about uh, big dogs that were around in the ancient world that were used in battle. He talks about them having troops of dogs. So, I mean, this is intimidating enough, just having uh, half a dozen here with the handler. But imagine a great troop of dogs slavering and snarling and coming for you. Huge value um, for intimidation in a military sense. It takes almost superhuman strength to rein in five massive dogs. Is this a clue as to the size of a unit under one dog handler? Now, this is an extraordinary feeling. They've just given me these five mastiffs to hold, which I think can pretty much do as they like, and they pretty much are doing as they like. But I think a trained handler, probably with a big stick, because the Romans weren't terribly friendly to their animals, could probably take four or five on a leash like this and go in. So they're not taking them as one. I, can, I see this as a handler going in with a whole fistful of mastiffs to intimidate and take out the enemy. The investigation suggests that if they did, it might have been beasts like these, in groups of up to five with a single handler. Rome must have used them more than Rome is letting on to us. But the way they were used remains a tantalizing mystery. Somehow, somewhere, for some reason, Rome is keeping a secret. I'm sure one day we will unearth some new bit of evidence. We just need one more clue to tell us what did the dog do for Rome. As yet, there is no archaeological evidence about canine special forces. However, vast amounts of historical evidence does exist about the samurai, those elite warriors of antiquity. Although even with them, there remain some intriguing mysteries and startling facts can still be uncovered. Yes, they had swords, but it wasn't their weapon of first choice. Their principal weapon was the horse and the bow. They were mounted archers. And in the age of the horse and the bow, where for centuries this ruled the battlefield, certain elite warriors, bodyguards and messengers, had a device called a horror. It was a special kind of flag, and allegedly it could stop arrows. Ancient Discoveries is investigating this implausible protective device. Can a team of leading experts unravel the mystery of how a simple piece of fabric was able to protect the samurai from a hail of arrows? Often outnumbered, relying on surprise and speed, special forces depend on superior equipment to carry out and survive their mission. In the ancient world, it was no different. Elite warriors wore the best protection they could afford. Perhaps the most extraordinary is what appears to be nothing more than a silk bedsheet. It's known as the Horo. It's shown in illustrations in the many ancient texts that chronicle the clan wars that ravaged Japan through the Middle Ages. At the beginning of the 12th century, the Minamoto and Taira families struggled to dominate Japan. Over five years, they clashed in a series of battles known as the Genpei Wars. A screen depicting the Battle of Ichinatani shows some Minamoto samurai wearing the Horo. The Horo was a cape worn by elite troops and decorated with emblems to indicate status or allegiance. But a mysterious secondary use is indicated by its translated name in English, Arrow Catcher or Arrow Entangler. In its time, the arrow was the deadliest distance weapon on the battlefield. The elaborate dress of commanders and elite troops made them distinctive targets. 
But in terms of sort of application, arrows and bullets fill the same niche in warfare. But in terms of the sort of materials that you might use to stop them, they're slightly different. Armor to protect against arrows was generally made of a hard, impenetrable material like metal or lacquered leather. So how could a piece of silk tied on with string give anywhere near the same level of protection? 3D analyst James Dean is investigating the physics of how a simple piece of cloth might stop a deadly arrow moving at over 80 miles per hour. And as the samurai is riding along, this layer of silk is billowing out behind him. And if we look at the fine structure of the silk, we can see that it's a very fine weave, which has two advantages. One, it's um, a very soft material, which means that the material will envelop the arrow. And secondly, it means that it's the tight weave prevents air getting through it. So it means that when we try and move it, it's creating a lot of drag and it's trying to resist that movement. And if we go back to the wider view, we can see what happens when we release an arrow into the structure. And if it goes in there, then as soon as we make contact here, we can see that the fabric is deforming and it's completely enveloped the arrow. And instead of just the tip of the arrow creating a, a very sharp contact point, here we can see that the, there's lots of points of contact. The material is, is completely wrapped around the head of the arrow and the shaft and flights are also causing drag. And this means that the arrow and all of its kinetic energy are now trying to drag the material along with it. And by the time we get close to the rider, we can see that the kinetic energy is completely dissipated and the arrow falls to the ground before it's made contact. But did the masters of the battlefield trust their lives to this theory? So, Richard, let's see what you've done with this. Aha! Uh -huh. That looks like a horror to me, but I don't think that would work. This is like a lampshade. That material is so tall. Yeah, well, we think this is the last version of it in its sort of ceremonial form. So that's imitating the billow yeah. um, when you're standing in a parade static. And this one's cotton. This one's cotton. And, of course, we can see here the Japanese heraldry here. So, I mean, that's the other function of this. Yes. I mean, it is an identifier. So if we've got to simulate that on the back, that's a heck of a lot of material to billow, isn't it? Is it is quite a lot of material. I, mean, I can just feel the weight of this. We're going to need a bit of a supercharged horse to get that to billow Whoa. out. But there are translations that I've read that say cotton, but others that say silk. The, the silk one's a very different beast altogether, um, much, much lighter. Oh, God, this that. is more akin to sort of modern or 20th century end. parachute silk. It needs very, very little air movement for that. Oh, look at that. There we go. There. Yeah. Samurai airbags. That's what we need. That's fantastic. I can see it functioning. What I can't really see is I can't see it stopping an arrow. What do you think? Well, one wouldn't think that that would have any resistance to an arrow. It doesn't seem very likely, does it? It doesn't. Well, I think the first thing to do is thing. to test it, um, and I think not on me, so <laughs> <laughs> wind machines, what's occurring to me. Mike has brought his samurai bow to the Ancient Discoveries testing ground. It might be that the horo doesn't stop an arrow, but it slows it down enough that it will no longer penetrate the armor. So we're going to test it against this um, ballistic jelly, which is supposed to simulate the density and resistance of human flesh. Look at this. That really does seem to have gone in quite... Oh, look at that. Really quite a long way. So that's a killing wound. Let's see if the horror will save my life. Silk is a famously light and strong material, but can it stop an arrow flying at 80 miles per hour? Testing his archery skills, Mike is surprised to discover an unanticipated feature of a horror billowing in the breeze. But if you look at it now, it's, it's sort of dancing. And especially with the mom, that's the heraldry on the back, is dancing about. So what would be a good aiming point for an archer is now confusing him considerably. That's, that's actually very difficult to aim at. That's amazing! You can see it's work! Completely unbelievable. And what would you fantastic. call that? You'd call it entangled. I would call it entangled, but also a stop. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that, had, that it, it completely exceeded my expectations. I'd say the point's still gone through, but I mean, it's the shaft. It stopped the shaft. It's extraordinary. It's genuinely surprising. It really is, isn't it? See, that, that's a sort of an armor piercing little, you know, narrow, bodkiny type yeah. arrow, yeah, yeah, because yeah. he would be wearing armor. The next test oh. is to try a big broadhead, a cutting head. Maybe the broadhead will cut the silk. 
pretty good, I think. Look at that. It's done what I predicted. It has cut through the silk. But then once it was in the silk, the weight of the shaft just dropped that silk down. Yes, that's right. So it came through, it used all its energy by then, and then it just dropped down. And these guys are going to be partially armoured anyway, aren't they? Exactly. We just want to resist the fatal penetration of armour. An ancient warrior fleeing for his life would have been lucky to have had only one arrow to contend with. Mike and Richard are building up a picture of how the horror would have protected a rider from numerous arrows fired from various angles and ranges. It's been both fascinating and frustrating at the same time. It was slowing them down. I mean, sometimes it was even just punching them out, like as if it was a trampoline. And yet there were others that did get through, and they went right through, completely defeated it, and hit this with a great smack. The horror in Mike and Richard's test successfully deflected 70% of the arrows fired at it. Mike feels this is an acceptable success rate for such a light and mobile protection. And good enough for him to test it in person. He will replicate the experience of a samurai warrior 700 years ago, on horseback being chased by a cavalry archer. It's going to be interesting. I've never heard of anyone ever trying this experiment before. It may work, it may not. It's a piece of material. It should, to me, the arrow should defeat it. But the Japanese had it for a long time. That gives an idea it has an effect. To ensure the safety of the horse, the arrows have been blunted. Shot, good shooting. So we've established the principle works. We've tested it on the wind machine. We can see that unless it's at extreme close range, it works. And now we've tested it on horseback. And I could feel it, I could hear it pop, I could sense it was saving me. I could feel it working. So I, I would feel quite secure with that, although, as you say, it's a big target, which is slightly counterintuitive for something that's to protect you. It's actually announcing this great target, but that's so much in Japanese culture. But, I mean, they would wear banners and standards on their backs, so they were really big into announcing who they were, and this does that. Yep. But the important thing is we've found a principle that works. The samurai were equipped with superlative weapons and ingenious protection. They were trained in mind and body. They were daring and courageous. They were the special forces of their day. The combat divers of Byzantium, the jungle archers of the Khmer, 